hear us and see us. Um, thank you for joining today. Um, so I'm Andrew Halfcree from Fluid Property Consultants, for those of you who don't know. Um, and I, um, my job is to try and find the uh, uh, speakers and presenters for CPD sessions for these um, CPN CPD sessions. Um, so today um, we are joined by Malcolm uh, Driscoll from um, FCS and Georgie Tarry from FCS um, to talk about AML compliance. Um, so FCS are uh, a well-established specialist in the provision of AML compliance, consultancy and training for businesses. Um, their clients include estate agencies, art market participants, law firms, property auctioneers and high value dealers. Um, and their services are used by uh, multiple organisations, large and small across the UK and major industry associations. Um, that includes ourselves at Flued, and I think there are five other members of the CPN network who um, use FCS. Um, so Malcolm, who's going to make the main presenta presentation today, um, he's been working for over 30 years in the police service in London in the investigation of serious and complex fraud and money laundering. Malcolm has an in-depth knowledge of how criminals seek to launder the proceeds of criminal activity on a global scale. He's an accredited NCA mentor and financial investigator and holds a Masters of Arts degree in fraud management and has extensive experience working alongside regulatory bodies such as HMRC, the Law Society and the FCA. He's a member of the International Compliance Association, holding an advanced certificate in anti-money laundering. So we all know um, as CPM members that we, um, uh, the majority of us have to get involved in anti-money laundering compliance. And uh, it's, um, it's a, a very complicated, diverse, time consuming area. So um, I'm gonna hand over to Malcolm now, who's going to um, talk through um, I think the, the the main mistakes that people often make uh, when trying to or not um, trying to uh, comply with anti money laundering. So I'll pass over to Malcolm. Thank you, Malcolm. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Andrew. Uh, as the as the title says, mistakes made in anti money laundering compliance. Unfortunately, it's the same things over and over again. Um, and I don't like to see anybody get fined. I don't like to see anybody all over the press. The names all over the press. And um, as you see here now, I've come into this uh, after, well, 40 years in the police service. It was nice of Andrew to say over 30. I'll have to actually be more specific. Really? It was 40. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and the people don't believe it, Georgie, do they? I wish if only that was the case. Um, yeah, a lot of my time was, um, was dealing with fraudsters. A lot of my time was dealing with organised crime groups. I think the thing about when we talk about money laundering, we have to appreciate that money laundering stems from crime. I know the money laundering regulations are very often seen as a pain to, to those involved in the real estate market, where I obviously now find myself. But the reality was one of the organised crime groups that I was dealing with was putting their ill-gotten gains. And I'd love to stay on this webinar and tell you all about their criminality, but you wouldn't sleep at night. So I'm forbidden to do that. Um, but the reality was they were, they were putting money through the property markets, all on the back of criminality. If we've got money from criminality, we've got victims of crime. I've now been here uh, with FCS compliance now five years. My how were time, uh, time flies past. Um, as you also see on there, yeah, I do the training for Property Mark and uh, a Right Move webinars, uh, as I was saying earlier on to Andrew, um, gets very well subscribed. And it's good to see that there is this interest in compliance, because if we don't do what we should be doing, well, it opens the door to money launderers and also Unfortunately, as we're going to discuss here today, it opens the door to be fined and have the name emblazoned all over the press, local and national media. So that's us. That's that's where that's where I come from. That's my background. And what we're going to do today is we as we discussed is 10 mistakes. I'm going to going to go through those. But my colleague Georgie is here um, and Hello. she's going to introduce herself as well. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, Yes, my name is Georgie Tarry. I'm the account director at FCS Compliance. Um, I will come in at the end and just give you a quick overview about how we can help and all of our services. But 
the most important thing is enjoy the session today. I know you'll find it useful. Please do ask questions in the chat box. I'll keep a close eye and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. So um, yes, just ask any questions you like, but I know you'll find the session useful. So um, Good. go Thanks. ahead, Malcolm. Yeah, yeah, thanks so, so much. So uh, we do want to allow time for questions at the end. Um, and these sessions, the, the time really, really goes quite quickly on them. So let's get to it. 10 most common AML mistakes and how to avoid them. Let, let's just let's just go through this. A practical approach. Okay, we know we've got to got to comply. We know we've got to comply, but how do we comply is very often the name of the game here. And what I do find, I go around and do audits. I do inspections very similar to what HMRC would do. Obviously, if I find faults, then nobody's going to get fined. Then people have a chance to put things right. Um, I go on HMRC inspections and I see the way that they do them and obviously keep up to date with everything that is going on uh, in the world of compliance. I have never been able to pass anybody in the real estate world on an audit. Now, that's not good news. I don't do that out of sheer bloody mindedness, I can assure you. But what I do is I do it to try and help those businesses and make sure that they going forward can then put things right. Very often, it's just the same things over and over again. We're going to talk about the fines. I'm going to show you um, an extract and they will just be extracts of, of agents that have been fined as a result of non-registrations, non-compliance. Yeah, the consequences the prejudice to the business, the reputational damage to the business as well. All of these things add up. And if you don't have anybody coming through your door or contacting you because they've seen you named and shamed, then we've got a problem because we no longer have a need for a business. So it is impactive. We know we have to do other things when we start a business and when we carry on a business. And this is one thing we need to do as well. So we need to embrace it. It's great to see so many people registering for this webinar. It's great to see so many people joining us now. And I want to give a chance for questions and answers at the end as well. So a few tips and, and uh, ideas of mistakes and how to avoid them when it comes to compliance. The health check. How often would you as your company do a compliance health check? And in this, this could encumber all the things we're talking about today. But first and foremost, a practical approach to doing it. Have a practical approach to doing it and embrace it. Embrace it as a need, a need to do a health check. Are we registered? Have we renewed? All right, I'll come on to the renewals because this latest list I'm going to show you, we're still waiting for the list of those that haven't been compliant with customer due diligence and not having documents they need. I'll talk about those as well. But the list we've got so far is endless of those that haven't been registered or failed to renew. So we need to know how we avoid falling at the first hurdle. And we need to be checking our registration, the policies and procedures and an anti-money laundering risk assessment, putting that in three and four together to try and save a bit of time. In. We have to have documents that are applicable to us. We have to know what is in those documents. We have to know that the staff have read our policy and procedures manual and are aware of the risk within our business. Yeah, your business. When I say ours, I mean yours. The policy and procedures and the risk assessments that your company have to have a legal obligation. But of course, if you manage a business, you want to know that your staff take responsibility and accept that responsibility. And if I forget to say it again, make sure when you've got these manuals that they have actually endorsed the fact and signed to say they've read them because there's a lot of thing in there that they need to confirm that they're aware of, just to show you as managerial responsibilities have actually gone through the procedures and told them what they need to know. So is the company doing what it says on the tin? It is pointless having an anti-money laundering policy and procedures manual, an anti-money laundering risk assessment. It is not assessing the specific risks and if it is doing something different to what it says. HMRC inspections regularly pick up on this. But of course, it's not just about inspections. It's about trying to keep that door closed when it comes to money launderers. Otherwise, the only people you're going to come and see you, if they see you on the naughty list, are money launderers. And you definitely don't want to be dealing with them. I saw enough of them in my time, I can tell you. They have no conscience. They don't worry about getting you in trouble, how much you're going to be fined. They will still try and launder their ill-gotten gains through you. 
What can we also do? Train staff. Have we got relevant trained staff and what constitutes relevant trained staff? Right. Do they know how to do customer due diligence? The areas that regularly need to be addressed? Well, I think when we look at it, we'd be looking at ID and proof of address and source of funds, etc. But very often I see pet checks, politically exposed person checks not being done. The source of funds very often I see not being done. Land registry checks not being done. If we don't do a land registry check, how do we know who owns a property, for example? And reviewing, have you got somebody within your business? Are you on this webinar as a money laundry reporting officer or as a deputy money laundry reporting officer or as a member of staff? But the responsibilities are there to review the files, to review how the company is doing. And what would constitute a regular review? Well, nowhere does it say what a regular review is. Some companies that I go to now instigate a check as soon as a file is progressed halfway through the transaction before it goes to exchange and also at the end as well to see if everything is there because if it's not it's a darn sight easier to try and put it back in the file and chase up what's been missing rather than two years down the line when you get an inspection and you find you've got gaps so spot checks also i i can't recommend them enough a spot check have all staff embracing the idea that they are going to have their work checked and perhaps even a fellow colleague, not necessarily the money laundry reporting officer, have a look. Have I done everything that you would do and vice versa? And by doing this, we can identify the training needs as we go along. It is pointless getting two years down the line and finding that things have been wrong for two years. Identify the training needs, take positive action, put them right. And in this last point here, I'm going to make a couple of recommendations and that is how to put the files together for ease because you don't want to be doing things i have many people contact me at the last minute when they've got an inspection and i try and uh, uh, assist them in putting things right and trying to assemble things so it keeps everybody happy keeping everything happy keeping everything good keeping everything in order is easier to monitor now i know some of that may sound like teaching granny to suck eggs but believe me it can take me ages sometimes to audit files because things are all over the place not something hmrc would be too happy with yeah and also untidy may mean that we've left the door open as well because we've forgotten to do something so if we take a practical view on how to comply and how to record we can show that we are also regularly checking but i'll come back to that one as well so those compliance health checks yeah regularly checking the health status of the company the registration let's come back to this we're going to see very shortly just some extract of companies that have been fined for not registering there is the government gateway if you are dealing with the real estate businesses then you are obliged to be registered with hmrc for AML purposes, not VAT purposes, as some people come through to me, I'm registered with HMRC for VAT. No, what about AML? Oh, I don't know what that is, I sometimes get told. I even did training this week, and somebody on the training course said, said they mentioned registration. We started trading in 2022. Should we be registered? You should be registered. Might have to face the consequences of not being registered for now nearly two years. I talk about here on guidance as well, okay, how best to apply your business and what are we what are we steered by? Well, we've got legislation, we've got money laundering regulations and we've got the proceeds of crime act. That's just two examples of the legislation that we need to adhere to. But regularly, we get updates from HMRC guidance for estate agents and all of those that come in the brackets of estate agents. Make a note of this one. Because if you were to get an inspection, I guarantee this would be one question that HMRC would ask. Don't tell them, by the way, that I told you what questions they're going to ask you. We'll have to keep that between ourselves. All right. But the 31st of January 2024 is the answer to the question, when was the latest guidance issued to real estate business by HMRC? The previous one was the 17th of July 2023. There are about 100 pages of this. There's not an awful lot change in the latest 31st of January 2024 from the 17th of July 2023. But 
100 pages takes a bit of reading. There's not an awful lot of changes, I say, but nonetheless, there are some changes to the guidance. When we're talking about the use of biometrics, people uploading instead of you seeing somebody perhaps face to face, the use of Zoom or Teams in order to see somebody rather than seeing them at the property, the dangers in doing so, and whether that's, that's actually acceptable or not. And of course, it may be acceptable if it really is the only way of doing something, but you can't just say it's the only way of doing something when in actual fact it's not the case. The legally required documents, again, going through this health check, are we registered? Is everything okay? Is it all up to date on site, on the HMRC site? Have we got the right information there? Have we got the right, right money laundry reporting officer listed? Have we got our right email and contact number listed? The address of the premises. I did an audit and had I not asked the question, the agent would have come unstuck because I said, well, you're not, you're not at the address that you've got on your registration. Oh, we haven't been there for four years. Okay. It's, it's basic stuff. And, I, you know, I don't like teaching granny to suck eggs, but at the same time, these are things that regularly get overlooked. Have we got policies and procedures, an AML policy and procedure, and have we got an anti money laundering risk assessment in place? Are we doing what it says on the tin? And is it up to date? And customer due diligence. This is where we're going to see fairly soon, I would suggest, fairly soon, another list of fines being issued. I know there's a list pending because during the time that HMRC were going out on inspections, I was going out on some of them as well and meeting meeting them. Obviously, I'm there to represent the agent or not represent, but be with the agent. So I know they're going out doing inspections. What do they do when they've been out? They've got to write them up, write them up and then issue the fines. Okay, They are doing their job. They are there to supervise the businesses. Businesses that unfortunately in our world are proving to be some of the worst in anti-money laundering compliance. So we can fight against the system as much as we want, but at the end of the day, we have to be compliant. And I know from my days in law enforcement and now from the national risk assessment and things like that, stats that are produced, our business is rife for being used and abused for money laundering because people can use so much money ill-gotten gains in such a short space of time and they will use and abuse you to their heart's content and I can absolutely guarantee it because I saw it and I saw it on the other side of the fence and now I see it now here. So customer due diligence, are the staff competent? Are they fully trained? Are they fully trained within the realms of completing anti-money laundering compliance? The registrations, I've mentioned this, the criminal offence to not register with HMRC for anti-money laundry purposes, I said about somebody on my course this week. It is a legal requirement to renew that registration every year. So when was the last time you went on to HMRC and noticed on the site whether you are shown as supervised? In other words, everything's hunky-dory and everything's okay. HMRC can see that you've registered with them. Or is it being shown as pending and able to trade? So what is the actual status of your company? Wouldn't surprise me if hardly anybody on this particular webinar has actually gone on there lately and, and checked that. If you have, please let me know and prove me wrong. But it's not the sort of thing that people generally do. They register, think everything's OK. 12 months later, hopefully you'll get a renewal. And, of course, really you receive a reminder. Some bad news. Let's get some bad news out of the way. Unfortunately, some emails from HMRC go into your junk email box. The junk email box normally of the money laundering reporting officer or the deputy, because the money laundering reporting officer will have provided their email address as the contact point. They may well have also um, entered into the registration, the company website, Notifications of inspections can sometimes go in the junk email box. Always check your junk email, especially if you're the money launderer reporting officer, because you don't want to find there's a knock on the door and HMRC are there saying that they sent you information to come to visit you about three weeks ago. Now, I've got to say that's unlikely to happen because they'd normally precede it uh, with a phone call. 
but a reminder about your renewal. You may be able to get one and can possibly do this on a mobile phone number because people I know change their mobile phone numbers sometimes as well. So totally free of charge now because we've been seeing this time and time again, what we've also done now is introduce from FCS compliance, AML Protect, right? It doesn't cost you anything. I, I and my colleagues, you know, it's a shame to see people having not renewed their registration when they go to so much effort, so much effort to do com compliance properly. And then they find that they've fallen at this first hurdle. So AML Protect, yeah, totally free of charge. Sign up, do it. You can speak to Georgie at the, at the end or take the number. Uh, on the email, it's not going to cost you anything. And we will make sure that we're up to date with when your renewal is due and that you'll get um, you'll get notification um, from ourselves as well. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting service to offer, actually. It just means that you'll get double the reminders and it should really help the agents. So very exciting. Let me know if you want to sign up, it's completely free. Yeah, and double the reminders. It's, I'd rather have it twice than not at all. You know, exactly. that, 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 that's the that's the key issue. Here. We'll, we'll, we'll go on to this and I'll show you some of the, um, unfortunately, some of those people that have been fined. And it is a name and shame game. And, and the requirements and confirmation of the changes. So you've got those. You can then see what is actually changed, what, what was before, what you've now done. How is it up to date? Is it all OK? So I talked earlier about the policy and procedures and risk assessments. On inspections, sorry, not on inspections, audits, on audits that I've done, when companies have asked us to do a health check or an audit at their company, come and have a look and see if we're doing okay. And nine times out of 10, it's just a few things that are wrong and we're able to identify those, which is not a bad position to be. Yeah, you, I know you're with me. Sometimes it can be a little bit worse than that. But this is what should be in a policy and procedures manual. The reality behind this is that it is taken for granted as I'm sure it will be OK. Well, I'm sure it will be OK was said to what was said to me on two occasions. One, I received four pages from somebody. And I asked the I asked the agent, where's head office? And they said, we don't have a head office. I said, well, why does it say in this policy and procedures document four pages? If I give you a clue. Hours are about 120 to 140 pages long because you, you're never going to get all this information in four pages. So the ones we put together are 120 to 140 pages, depending on whether you do lettings or not. So four pages. And I said, well, where did this come from? And the agent said, well, actually, we printed it off the Internet and put it up, put our logo on the top. Another agent gave me six pages. Again, it's not going to be um, enough within there. And I said, I'm just popping outside. And the agent said, well, you've only just got here. I said, well, I'm, I thought I was coming to ABC Estate Agents. He said, well, you are. I said, well, this has got a completely different company name on it. And they, oh, sorry. Yeah, we, we, we did get, we just haven't changed the name on it. It's got to be yours. It's got to be bespoke to you. One of the main criticisms and failings and where people get fined is, is not having your documents, your own documents. Yes, it does describe the, the legislation that covers you. It's a manual, it's a go-to book for people that um, perhaps new to the business or as a, as a ready reckoner, if you're dealing with these things day in, day out. It describes what money laundering is. I say to people on training courses that I take, tell me what money laundering is, and they tell me, well, it's moving money from one place to another. Well, if we, that, that means we'd all be guilty of money laundering. What, what in essence it really is, is moving criminal money around not moving all monies, and the roles and responsibilities, money laundry reporting officer and staff. And if you're in management at a company, then you can say, my staff have read this, read this manual and it shows them what their responsibilities are. It's a ready reckoner as well to, for customer due diligence, the completion of customer due diligence. Main failings within customer due diligence. Some files not having individuals' documents, not doing land registry, not having a source of funds for the buyers or those that are renting properties for the money laundering regulations, obviously for lettings over a certain threshold at the moment, which might be changing, but we can do that on another, another webinar. Keeping records. I'll ask you now how often or how long you need to keep your records for. If you, I was to ask you that question as a HMRC inspector, would you know 
how many years you need to keep your records for? Well, the answer is no less than five, but I have numerous figures shouted at me during the course of my training sessions. A bit like Bruce Forsyth's play your cards right, higher and lower on occasions, to be honest. Identifying red flags. Some people new in the business won't have your experience. So they've again, they've got a manual to go to, some of the red flags that exist in their business. And reporting suspicious activity, well, here at FCS Compliance, because myself and my colleagues, some used to work for the National Crime Agency, um, others in law enforcement, some in the banks, um, somebody from HMRC. We've got experience in doing this suspicious activity reporting. And it's not the sort of thing you do every day of the week, but there is guidance within your manual to, to show you how you submit suspicious activity reports. And yet agents are still submitting them wrong and causing themselves a lot of problems. The guidance that was issued on the 20, uh, sorry, 17th of July, 2023, uh, well, that updated how often training should be done. We'll have a look at that in a moment. They should describe how you deal with politically exposed persons. You can't deal with people subject to financial sanctions and every company must have an anti-bribery and corruption policy. With the risk assessment, the national risk assessment, which should have been renewed in 2023, probably won't get renewed this year probably and hopefully will be renewed in 2025. The reason it hasn't been renewed, not only obviously have things gone a little bit on hold because of election days, but prior to this, they were on hold because there was so much data around markets and industries and the use of money laundering that it's taken a time to assess what risk particular businesses will be in. Now, the real estate world in December 2020 was elevated to a high risk of being used and abused for money laundering. Estate agents themselves were elevated from low to medium. So if we've now got so much information about the use of the business for money laundering, is it gonna be that we're gonna have agents as a high risk as well? And obviously I'm well aware in my world that we do have a lot of money laundering taking place through the property market. And if that's the case, perhaps that would explain why HMRC in the, perhaps the last two years have employed over 3,000 more staff. The supervisory obligation that they've got is going to be extended. And the supervisory obligation they've got will mean they're going to extend that to doing more inspections, is my guess. So an anti-money laundering risk assessment that is bespoke to you covers these five key subjects. The customers, who are they? Every company is different. Every company is different. Um, some companies will deal all, only with people from overseas. Uh, some will deal with companies, some will deal with trusts, some will deal with overseas individuals, uh, UK companies, UK trusts. Um, where, are, where are these people from? Are they from high risk jurisdictions? Do we know where they're from? What are the checks that we do? Do we use online verification? Do we always establish the source of funds? Do we work as joint sole agents and the risks that can be associated with that? Do we ever place reliance on other, other parties as well? And if we do, do we realize the dangers that are there? If somebody says, yes, we've done our compliance checks, and then you as an agent say, oh, well, that's all right, they've done them. It's not. That's the problem. You can't place reliance on somebody else unless you get those documents and get that information and know what they've done is right, because there's an awful lot of people out there that don't know what they're doing. So you don't want to take somebody's word for it, especially when you will always be liable. So the risk assessment is your business and it's extensive. Thankfully, not another 100 pages. I think the ones we do are around about 19 pages. I did one this morning, around about 19 pages, but it covers all these subjects. And you've got about 44 categories in there. And I mentioned an independent audit. OK, now this is this is part of legislation that says you should carry out an independent audit. Interestingly enough, the guidance in um, September referred to internal audit function. So what you want to be able to say is you've put yourself in a position where you have done the checks. Have you got somebody experienced and able and confident to say, I'm doing an audit of the company's records and how it's going and uh, if the files are correct, if we've got all the documents we need, if the registration's up to date, et cetera, et cetera. 
So that's fine. But of course, some companies, and this is why I go around quite a lot to, to see companies, is put somebody in, put somebody in and say, right, just tell us. We don't need to do an awful lot, to be honest with you. Just need to examine a few files because it's generally the same mistakes that are happening time and time again. The obtaining of the correct documentation. As I've already said, I examine files, no land registry checks, no PEP checks, no sanctions checks. Uh, source of funds hasn't been obtained, or if it has, it's not been evidenced. Where somebody's just said, well, I've got a mortgage and savings. Oh, that's all right then, mortgage and savings. No, it's not. We've got to evidence it. The certification of documents, has that been done correctly? If you're not sure, well, you know, up upskill and get trained on what certifications are acceptable and what ones aren't. Because that is a main failing of uh, by HMRC. Documents not being certified. You as agents are allowed to certify documents. You can't help me, unfortunately, apply for a new passport. But you can certify documents as a true likeness of somebody that you've seen. If you saw me at Fire Acacia Avenue, for example, you could say you certify that. And I'm at, it is a true likeness. And you've seen the original document. Beneficial owners. When I examine files, what I very often find is that if somebody's dealing with a company, company interested in completing compliance properly, but what have they done? What they've done is got all directors' information, no information on who the shareholder is, just information on the directors, which we're not really interested in. So although sometimes compliance is seen as a lengthy process, the reality behind it is we could actually save ourselves some time on some occasions. And are high-risk issues flagged to the money laundry reporting officer? The money laundry reporting officer has got to be told if you're dealing with PEPs or high-risk jurisdictions or high-risk customers. And also, one that's really been picked up on just lately, is if you have got properties that you are marketing in the top 5% of value in the area in which you transact, that should be identified to the money laundry reporting officer as a potential that you've got to do enhanced due diligence. Are companies using the online verification services properly? I did an audit at an office. I looked at their result and there was red all over it. And I said, oh, what, what, what was this all about? Being an ex-detective, I'm now interested. What, what, what was this? You know, it's got red marks. They said, oh, no, we just do the checks. No, you don't just do the checks. You've, you've got to look at what the results are as well. So, you know, there's there's ways of doing this. And we identify any training needs. What we, what we do is we put ourselves in a strong position. By embracing this, taking this on board, we put ourselves in a strong position to be compliant and not make the mistakes we're talking about. The training, yes, you've got to keep a, a clear record of who's been trained, when they were trained, etc. As I say, it was updated on the 17th of July 2023. The compulsory attendance was made every two years. The reality is this. I would suggest if you've got companies, uh, a responsibility with the company, for me, Regular things every 12 months seems to make more sense. We have changes in legislation. We have changes in guidance and things change very quickly. And also on the automatic IT systems we've got now, we can flag it up every 12 months to get everybody trained. But of course, sometimes there may be a need for regular training if we do get a change in legislation and if we do get a change in guidance as well. OK, um, the bad news. Um, this this was issued. Um, we were now time goes so quickly. I think it was end of April. Um, named and shamed. HMRC put this on their website, um, and not everybody would readily go to uh, to a HMRC website. But of course, the press and the media do. As you see there, uh, what have we got? Four thousand seven hundred. Th these are just fines for not applying for registration. OK, at the required time. So it could be applied for registration or renewing. £14,850, £14,500. These, 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 I've just put two pages on here for the sake of um, for the sake of showing everybody. Um, but, you know, £14,500, that's a lot of money for a business to lose. We don't really need to lose it. OK, just by keeping things in order. Um, and as I say, it is unfortunate, but we are going to see another list. And local media and national media have a field day with this. They know these are going to be published. And unfortunately, the next thing you know is you've got a headline there, ABC agency 
something, something, something money laundering. Well, they're not money laundering. What it is, is a headline grabber. And it just shows that beneath it, the information is that they're being fined for not registering. Or as we're probably going to find in what is going to be another extensive list that we've got agents being fined um, for non-compliance outside of not registering, not having right documents, not completing customer due diligence properly. In brief, this is what we put together um, and what we found on the on the latest information. 254 estate agency businesses, total fines, 1.6 million pounds, an average fine of six and a half grand. Even that's going to make an impact on the business. Yeah. And the highest fine that we saw so far, 52, it may have even been 52 and a half thousand. Um, huge impact upon businesses. And unfortunately, 25 of those firms were fined more than £10,000. OK, so significance. But look at this last figure. Look at this with me. 4,000 real estate businesses aren't registered or have failed to renew. And bearing in mind that is a criminal offence, is it any wonder we're making it easy for HMRC to come in and take us to pieces? Yeah, take us to task. So we don't need to be in that position. I'm sure we don't need to be in that position. On those inspections, let me let me just give you a little bit of an insight and try and help you in this in this respect. The absence of correct anti-money laundering, customer due diligence documentation and training, a lack of staff training. Well, if we do what we've just been talking about, we should have things in order, shouldn't we? We should be able to put things in order and make sure we're doing things OK so that we know that we've got the correct information in the file and it's been dealt with accordingly. We don't play at this. We don't play at other things to do with our business. If we open up a business, we find out everything we've got to do to get on with the business. It's just the same as having desks and chairs in an office. Anti-money laundering and the compliance of anti-money laundering is just the same. It's still a requirement as having somewhere for the staff to sit. Regular fault. Uh, unfortunately, I saw this um, on an inspection. I had tried to assist the agents, but there were some things that they couldn't do wrong. I went on the inspection. I sat with them, saw HMRC looking at some of the files. It was on a big screen. Uh, and I saw that the house was marketed January 2020, I think it was. And I kept praying and praying and praying. And I thought, oh, it's not happening here. All of a sudden, 18 months later, July 2022, customer due diligence is done for the first time on the seller of a property, even though it's been marketed for 18 months. Can you probably guess why it had suddenly been done? Because they'd come up with a buyer for the property and then they thought they'd do it all together. Glaring mistakes, yeah. Failing to recognize the requirement for enhanced due diligence, as I said. High risk customers, high risk jurisdictions. Do we know what the high risk jurisdictions are in the world? We've recently had, well, not that recently now, but recent enough, two, two other countries added, Kenya and Namibia, and we've had four that have been removed from the list, including the UAE. But I'm telling you this, would you know who have been added and who have been taken off the list? Because if you're dealing with people from overseas territories and jurisdictions, then you've got to know what the high risk jurisdictions are on the list. And those documents not certified and expired documents. Wouldn't believe the amount of times that when I do an audit, unfortunately, I find that a, a passport is now well out of date. It was taken at the commencement of the engagement. Yeah. But the property has been on the market for two years, for example, and that the passport expired six months after it went on the market. Yeah. Not certified correctly. Must be a true likeness. Has anybody seen the original? Yeah. Even if it's going through biometrics checks, yeah, through online verification like Smart Search, Credit Safe, Lexus, Nexus, Third, Fourth, W2, Global Data, Verify, etc. Did you see that person? Can you confirm that when Malcolm Driscoll has uploaded his document onto the biometric system, that that was actually Malcolm Driscoll, passport and face? Yeah. Was that Malcolm Driscoll that you saw at Five Acacia Avenue? Or have you now got somebody completely different? So these are the failings, and these are just so easy to try and prevent. A quick word on conscious times getting on, and I know we want to get to some questions. Just a couple of quick tips. Try and keep the files 
tidy and in order. I know that again, sounds like teaching granite is like eggs, but some files are all over the place. Have buyer's documents separate to, uh, to, to seller's documents, landlord's separate to, to tenant's documents, um, but with, still within under the property that you're dealing with. I say this because that's the way that HMRC like to view them. Also, if you've got a case management system, have it so that we've got the value of the property, the address of the property, yeah, whether we're dealing with the buyers or the sellers, um, the date it went on the market. But also have a ready-made box there to show that it's been checked, perhaps not on more on, on more than one occasion as well, to show that it's been visited and show that the customer due diligence that's been done has been kept up to date. Record that check on the case management system. And I say that because that is good mitigation. If HMRC starts to find things wrong, it's great mitigation to show that you have been doing the best you can. You cannot just say, I've done the best I can. And then HMRC find that unfortunately that's not the case. Because we will realize on those checks that we haven't got title to properties, that we haven't done PEP checks or sanctions checks, we haven't got the proper ID or it hasn't been dealt with properly. And going back to somebody two years down the road because you've got an inspection saying, um, could you tell me where you got the money from for that property? It's embarrassing. And most of you wouldn't want to do it, and I understand that. And by doing these regular checks, it identifies the training needs as we go through. And all of a sudden, you've then got an office that is buzzing with their confidence in compliance, rather than the opposite, as I see, sheer panic over the course of a weekend trying to put things right. Georgie. Amazing. Thanks, Malcolm. So good. Um, right, everyone, I'm going to just give you a quick overview about our services at FCS Compliance. Um, I will be very quick and then we'll go on to questions. So a reminder, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat box and we can go through that in a second. So primary services, we offer an AML audit. Now, this is a really good place to start. And what we can do is we can come to your office or we can do it remotely. We'll just have a really good look at your policies and procedures, your risk assessment documents, six files of your choice or as many as you like. And we'll come back to you with a full report, just letting you know all of our findings and if there's anything missing. It's a really good place to start. And actually, we'd recommend doing that at least every two years just to make sure that you're you're always on track. Policies and procedures and risk assessment. Now, as Malcolm said, they're absolutely fundamental and they're the first thing that HMRC will ask to see. Now, the main thing is that they have to be bespoke to your business. Um, so what we would do is we'd ask you to fill out a questionnaire so that we get the key details about your business, how you operate, the clients that you deal with, all of the key information, and then we'll go away and put your bespoke documents together. As Malcolm said, and I completely agree, it's your manual to refer to. So I always say to clients that it's not just something you need to have. It's going to be actually really useful for you to look at and refer to. And also, most importantly, just make sure you do what you say you do in those documents, because that's something that HMRC are very, very keen on. So training is a legal requirement. Uh, we do lots of training. A lot of it is remote on Zoom, which works very well. And also we can come in person as well. Um, I recommend the foundation level course as the entry level legal requirement. This is um, four hours in total, but we split it into two hour digestible sessions over two mornings. It's CPD certified, so you'll get a certificate that you can put on your file to show that you and your staff have attended the course. The advanced level is great. If, if you've done the foundation course and you want to go into some further depth about customer due diligence and companies and trust, then I highly recommend the advanced level. And then the refresher course is brilliant sort of a year after the foundation level course as a top up session. Now, technically speaking, the legal requirement is to do training at least every two years. But there's a caveat in the legislation where they say, but you must keep in the loop with the legislation. 
So as a business, for good practice, we definitely recommend a refresher course every 12 months. It's just one hour and um, you can do it online. The MLRO course is a brilliant course. If you're the money laundering reporting officer or the deputy money laundering reporting officer, this is a great course because it just covers your roles and responsibilities and what you need to do. That's two hours in total. Again, it's CPD certified. Now, customer due diligence, it's good for you to be aware that we do customer due diligence as a service and it's on a pay as you go basis. So you don't need to sign into a contract. You don't need to commit to a certain number of referrals with us. The key thing with us, though, is that we will take care of the whole due diligence from the very beginning to the very end. There's a lot of online verification systems out there that are absolutely brilliant. They're not a competitor of ours. The difference being is that they form part of the process. So we use an online verification system ourselves. They're very good for checking if they're a politically exposed person or not, um, but they don't cover the whole process, whereas ours is from the very beginning to the very end. And we have a team of consultants that work on that um, all day. So just let me know if you want to have a chat about that. Um, and the rate depends on the type of client it is. So um, UK individuals will be cheaper, obviously, than an overseas trust and company. But very happy to chat this through with you after if you want to have a call. Um, consultancy wise, well, you can see that Malcolm's seriously experienced with HMRC inspections, knows exactly what they're looking for. So don't panic. If you get a letter from HMRC, just know that we're there to help and we can give you support with how to prepare and what you need to do before the day of an inspection. And also we can actually be there on the day, if you like, to accompany you. Um, Malcolm had one, I think it was a couple of weeks now, that was 10, 10 hours in total, ten, ten it past hours, six, yeah. which ten I think was very hours. unlucky and not the norm, but um, it's just good for you to know that we are there if you need us. Suspicious activity reports, you may find the need to submit a SAR to the National Crime Agency. Now it's so worth, given the volume that they receive, it's absolutely worth getting it right in the first submission. It has to be very detailed and very precise. And that's something that we help agents with lots. Um, so just bear that in mind. And then last but not least, the AML hotline is hugely popular. That is included for the first year when we put your policies and procedures and risk assessment in place. What it means is that your team can call us if you have any queries throughout the year, um, just for those quick questions where you just want to speak to an expert there. So. Um, but that's a general overview. But as I say, you'll get my details at the end. And if you want to have a chat about anything, just let me know. I can see on the side that we've had a couple of questions, which is great. Yeah. Um, uh, shall I shall I take them as they come, George? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, I know I know you did have um, some given to you before, but I, yeah, do, like I, do. I, I do like these. Joanne, um, you're, you're going to come on every webinar with me from here on in because this question right um is is one that needs to be addressed uh what should we do if a joint agent or client purchaser doesn't provide the required documentation despite being chased numerous times but we have no reason to believe it's suspicious okay two parts here so good question if, that's... yeah if if you're working with another agent okay if you're working with another agent then the reality is that they should abide by the money laundering regulations. They should understand that you abide by the money laundering regulations. And, um, and as such, the exchange of information between the two of you should be acceptable. If anybody ever says to you, oh, no, uh, th this breaches client confidentiality or uh, it breaches uh, GDPR, it does not. OK, there's actually an artic article six of GDPR. Have a look at it. Now you've done an hour's webinar this morning. What more could you want than to go look at GDPR? I am joking, by the way. But for your information, Article 6 GDPR, it permits the exchange of information between two parties in the regulated sector for an anti-money laundering purpose. OK, but Joanne, I guess sometimes you may have even tried that as well. And they'll still say you're not having it. OK, perhaps for the sake of business or whatever. So you have to show you've done the best you can. And the same goes for 
if you're dealing with clients and purchasers. Now, when you say we have no reason to believe it's suspicious, one of the appendices, when I talk about our manuals being so long, about a third of the manual is the appendices, right, that you could want on a day-to-day -day basis. One of those appendices is reliance, and one of those appendices is a notice that goes to the client or customer telling them, this is who we are, this is what we do, and we have to abide by the money laundering regulations, and this is why we need this doc these documentation. So somebody not giving it to you, right, to me would make it suspicious, okay, for, for a start. So, but I guess, you know, every circumstance is different. Can you still continue? Yes, you can, but you'd have to justify why you're going ahead with that transaction if you're not getting documentation. How else could you get it? Well, if it may be held by a solicitor and the solicitor may be able to give it to you. But of course, the solicitor may say, no, it breaches client confidentiality, it doesn't. A client, they, or it may, they may say it reaches GDPR, which again, it doesn't. This question could, and I deal with this in the training sessions, but in brief, as brief as I can now be, you have to show you've done the best you can and why you consider there are no suspicions and why you are considering carrying on with this, uh, this transaction. All right. So I hope that helps a little bit, but you have to document everything you've done. It's been picked up uh, quite recently, uh, or regularly, I should say, by HMRC, that, you know, we said you can't get it, but you've gone ahead anyway. What efforts have you made to get this and then justify going ahead? Yeah. If a Record keeping. Yeah. If a solicitor won't give you the information and they're the only ones holding it and you can't get it from an agent, yeah, check on the agent. Are they registered with HMRC for AML purposes? If they are, it's one check. You can say, well, they should know what they're doing. But also, actually, you shouldn't be acting as a joint sole agent with another agent if they're not registered with HMRC for AML purposes. That very often has been overlooked in the past as well. So there's lots of things around that question. Joanne, I'm so glad you asked it because it is a reliance issue and it is the practical approach to dealing when you get that brick wall. All right. Um, Doing what you can, I guess. It's yeah, sort of yeah. And as you say, Julie, plan registry it's and... recording it. Recording it. Um, right. I like so, Jake's question. I, yeah, I like Jake's question. What did the HMRC do with the money collected from the fines? Well, I'll tell you what I think happens to it. And that comes back to my days in, in law enforcement. The um, monies that are seized from um, would be criminals or um, from the criminal fraternity, if they're restrained assets or if they're criminal funds or found in possession of cash, they can't explain and that sort of thing. Generally what happens is 50% goes to the government and 50% goes to law enforcement that have dealt with that particular case because it is designed to help with the fight against acquisitive crime. I'm gonna say this, that insofar as um, HMRC, yeah, then their monies would have to go initially to the government. They would then apply for the monies that they have actually, unfortunately, had to find people for. And then they would use that to bolster their services to try and provide more supervisory um, skills and attributes and, and availability and staffing. Again, th this is an issue. I've already said they've just recently, in the last 12 months, employed 3,000 more staff. The monies will go into the pot to be used for those purposes. If it's anything else, I've got to say, Jake, I'm not aware. Um, so uh, that's, as, that's as best as I can do on that one. Um, it's not just wishful thinking. I think that is, you know, genuinely where where it goes. Yeah. Mark, do you want me to read it out? or? You... Yeah, OK, I, if you want, Georgie. Um, when an ID is uploaded, uploaded through a biometric system and the agent needs to verify that the uploaded ID matches the person they met, how does this process work when dealing with multiple shareholders and having only met one contact? In large organisations, it's often unrealistic to meet all of the ultimate beneficial owners. So how can compliance be ensured in such scenarios? OK, um, right. Uh, in, insofar as ultimate beneficial owners, what we've got to bear in mind is the documents we need when dealing with a company. OK, now we may have multiple shareholders. We may have beneficial owners, but the ultimate beneficial owner is the person with more than 25% of the shares in a company. 
So therefore, it may well be that the person you're seeing is that ultimate beneficial owner. It may well be you're seeing a representative of the company that isn't the ultimate beneficial owner. If they're a representative of the company, you would need to do ID checks on that representative who would then hopefully be able to give you the certificate of incorporation, the memorandum and articles of association, ultimately the share certificate. Yeah. And if they're a director, we'll get proof that they're on the list of directors as well. But the share certificate is the most important document. OK, in which case your obligations to customer due diligence are to the shareholder, the ultimate beneficial owner who's got more than 25 percent of the shares. Mark, you will know that sometimes this can get more complicated because sometimes the beneficial owner or the ultimate beneficial owner of a company will be another company or it might then be a trust or we might have layers of companies and trusts. Georgie mentioned about us doing customer due diligence. I guess probably the most complicated ones. Some people use this for everything, but certainly the most complicated ones tend to come to us to try and sort out. And we've had yeah. pages, sometimes overlapping onto two pages, Georgie, haven't we? Yeah, exactly. These are the sort of perfect scenarios where it goes beyond the usual and you just think, actually, I quite like to offset this to our team to just take care of it all from the very beginning to the very end but Mark's just asked so if we're meeting with a company contact but they're not a shareholder or a majority shareholder do they need to do the see the ID on it? Yeah, absolutely if they are representing the company in their capacity uh, or even if they're not in the capacity of the company but they've been sent to you as a representative yes you do you must know who you're dealing with and one thing that regularly gets forgotten, Mark, again, can't thank you enough for the question. One thing that regularly gets forgotten is if they say they're representing the company, have you actually had any proof to confirm they've got authority to act? So that's something to add to the file as well. But yeah, Mark, ID the representative if they're representing the company and predominantly the customer due diligence will be done on the ultimate beneficial owner, not the directors. The directors may not have any shares in the company whatsoever, in which case they've got no control over the assets of the company, no ownership of the assets. But the ultimate beneficial owner, good to see Mark using that phrase on there as well, because very often that gets forgotten. Yeah, the ultimate beneficial owner. What if you've got four people with 25% of the shares each? Yeah. yeah. Person of significant control. Yeah, that's the person. That's the person we're looking for there, the person of significant control. Okay. And Mark just says, um, and what happens if we don't meet the UVA? Well, this this can be quite, it can be quite normal um, on you know big big companies to not meet the ultimate beneficial owner, but it doesn't mean to say we shouldn't get their documents and we shouldn't be doing the checks on them. So yeah, we can start, obviously there's always a risk, a slightly higher risk if you know we aren't seeing people face to face. You know, it's one of those red flags. Why aren't I seeing them? Well, I'm not seeing them because they're an ultimate beneficial owner of a large company that doesn't want to see me. I've done the ID checks on the person that is representing the company. I've got the ID documents for the person and I've run them through the systems, the online verification systems. Yeah, I can't certify it that I've met this individual, but the document has been certified and confirmed by the online system that we've actually submitted it through. All right. So biometrics are sufficient for UBO says mark but there's a risk if we do not meet them yes but if we evidence why that shows we're doing as much as we're able to absolutely but biometrics what i would say is go seriously look at that hmrc guidance just put it into google hmrc guidance for estate agents you will see it and there's a couple of dates there but the one in blue is the 31st of january 2024 okay go to that Control F, hey, look at me, the old IT expert here. Control F, yeah, put in the word biometrics, yeah, and you'll see that it does come with the cautions, the dangers in using the biometrics, as opposed to you seeing me, Mark, at five Acacia Avenue and taking a copy of my passport. Great. And I guess the the advanced level course could be good if if Mark you want to 
go into further depth about companies and trusts and the due diligence and do a practical exercise and stuff, then that's what I'd recommend. Indeed. Yeah, Georgie, on the on the advanced course, uh, I've just completed doing one with um, delegates this week. On the advanced course, we actually do a practical exercise. Yeah, one is looking at a, co a customer due diligence file and I throw it out to you to tell me where it's gone wrong and what I've yeah. left out. And the other one is trying to get behind a not too complicated structure of an ultimate beneficial owner behind companies and trusts. Yeah, perfect. And uh, I've had a um, question from Gerard, which is, is there a simplified method to obtain HMRC satisfactory proof of funds? Is there a simplified method to obtain HMRC satisfactory proof of funds? Um, I wouldn't say necessarily a, a simplified method of HMRC. What, um, what we tend to do, one of the appendices is a source of funds form, okay? A questionnaire. Your client your, or your customer would complete those, yeah, and then provide documentary evidence with it. Uh, it's, not, it's not really uh, any more complicated than that. It shows where they say they're going to get the monies from. Might be from the sale of a house, in which case then you get, you know, the documents that are going to show you how much money is coming, what's the equity in this property, and we're putting savings towards it, or we're going to continue with the mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. So I would never use the word simplified for source of funds. Source of funds is what it is. That's what you yeah. need. Uh, and again, training, you know, if if it's required, just to, just to upskill or, you know, come on the course and say, well, look, okay, I wasn't, you know, wasn't sure. Now I am. You know, no, yeah. nothing better than be confident. If you get visits, nothing uh, better to be confident that staff are doing uh, exactly on the button. Wonderful. Well, it's one That's an hour. So. We've got, we're, we're over an hour, Georgie. I mean, yep. I'm just coming back in there. Um, thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Georgie. Um, very comprehensive, um, a lot of food for thought there, uh, a lot of issues that we all need to uh, take on board. And I'm sure um, we all need to go and review everything that we're doing on AML. It's a, a subject that's getting uh, just growing and growing in terms of relevance to our uh, various businesses. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate the, um, I think we've got the Oracle um, in Malcolm um, <laughs> joining us today. So uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. That's been um been excellent. Uh, thank you, everybody, for um, joining us today um, and the questions. Um, yeah. I think George is, um, uh, for those who, who want to take advantage of um, or, or explore the services that FCS provide, George um, uh, will provide some contact details. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. So, yeah, a, a final thank you to uh, Georgie and Malcolm. Uh, also, thank you to Leslie and Lara. Leslie for setting it all up, all the, the, the demo and hosting it, and uh, Lara for promoting um, the event. So, thank you very much. And um, thank we'll, you um, very much yeah. for having us. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. And if we can, if we can help in any way, don't want to see, don't want to see anybody's name from CPN on the, on, on that naughty list. Don't Absolutely. All right. But trying very hard to avoid it with your help. So appreciate that. Yeah, we'll do our best. We certainly will. That's great. Pleasure. All right. Good Thank to see you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Cheers. Bye-bye.